when we first came here, the three kids said almost in unison, can we get out and climb that mountain, Mum? I said, when you get a little older, then Mummy will climb with you. You have that yearning to see what's beyond those mountains. Those mountains are there to hold up the clouds. And I, I think that's, that's BC. Mount Robson is the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies. But you, you can see definitely that it's changing. This part with that glacier that came down, I've noticed that it has receded. There definitely is a change in the climate. As a scientist and broadcaster, I followed climate change for decades and initially viewed it as a slow motion catastrophe. I didn't think we'd experience it until I was long gone. Now, in my 80s, having lived most of my life in British Columbia, I'm also a witness to our province being on the front lines of climate change. The issue of climate is really the critical, the existential issue of our time. The science has been in for over 30 years, and yet the denial, or at least the inability to take the big steps to move us in a dire different direction are not there. We know that the problems that our children and grandchildren face will be immense. So when we have prime ministers who say, we can't do anything about global warming, it'll destroy the economy, we elevate the economy above the very things that keep us alive. You know, the American poet Gary Snyder says that the, the two most revolutionary words you can say are, I'm staying. Stay put, stay in place, so that you belong to the land. That's when you're going to really fight to protect that piece of, of the planet. So I think it's important to meet with people who are outside who are looking at the world, who know that the world is changing, to tell us, stop fooling around. It's changing and we've got to do something to keep it from getting any worse. Let's go visit these people across the landscape, hear their stories, and see what they're seeing regarding climate change. Our journey begins along the Pacific coast in Haida Gwaii, the island homelands of the Haida Nation and some of the largest and oldest trees on Earth. When I go out there and talk about you know, climate change with people, people talk about it as like this, this uh, hypothetical thing. And then you come home to Haida Gwaii, we feel it directly. We've had, I think it was a 40-year historic drought where I think, you know, at one point it's, it was like 36 days without rain. Haida Gwaii is a rainforest. So that has huge impact on us. So all the rivers that we rely on historically, you know, we're seeing the, the levels being low. It's affecting fishing, it's affecting everything. But these are people's traditional practices. Generations have gone to the Copper River or to the Yakun River to harvest sockeye. If this keeps up, you know, that's, uh, that's gonna end. It's not about, oh, we'll go fish somewhere else. You're stopping generational practices. It's our life, it's our well-being. So asking them to change that is telling them to change who they are. Everybody should have that awareness that, you know, your actions have a reaction to those, you know, that you may not see or, or appreciate or feel. 
you know, for the Haida people, we are an ocean people and there's massive risks to Haida Gwaii today and that's what we're going to focus on. So now we're, you know, we're really diving into that, uh, that problem of protecting Haida Gwaii from tankers and then from shipping. You know, all we ask is people to be aware. We're not talking seven generations from now. We're talking the next generation. If we don't stand up and do something, I don't feel comfortable pushing this off to my children to tackle. A big part of BC's identity and culture relates to its mountains. Whistler Blackcomb is one of these iconic regions, the largest ski resort in North America, with over two million visitors a year. Climate change is already impacting this tourist destination, and they're having to adapt. So ultimately, to be able to run this mountain resort without generating waste, carbon, or other emissions is, is our, ultimately our goal. We had an early wake-up call of climate change simply because glaciers are the most sensitive ecosystem. They're nature's thermometer. For every degree Celsius increase, the snow line will go up 120 meters. For over a decade and a half now, we have been putting lifts higher, more snowmaking, more summer grooming as part of our adaptation to a future with less snow. It creates challenges for us, but we're not a low elevation ski area. The majority of our terrain is, is in the Alpine here, as you can see. So we do have considerable resilience, but uh, it is certainly one of, if not the uh, greatest challenge for our industry now. We have to change direction as a global community or ultimately uh, places like this uh, may lose their, their relevance. Changes in snowpack and precipitation are also affecting the Okanagan Valley. The area and its residents are challenged by warmer conditions and weather extremes, leading to an increase in floods and droughts. This adversely affects people's homes, food production, and many other facets of life within this iconic valley known for its fruit and wine production. So we're standing in the Okanagan, and the lake you see behind me is Okanagan Lake. The Okanagan is a headwaters, meaning that there's no water that flows through it. The water they get is the water that falls on the ground or in the mountains here. When we get the warm weather and we get those heavy torrential rains and the snow melt on the mountains is also melting at the same time, we can have huge floods. That's a concern. We have this lake that is bigger than it has been in a hundred years. It just started raining and snowing and the lake started filling up and they couldn't empty the lake fast enough. It's just going to keep going up. People don't really know how to respond to it because no one who is alive right now has seen this much water in the lake. It's a little bit hard for people to come to terms with because this is not how things are supposed to be. We're dealing with a situation where we have more extremes going on. This crop is actually right on the edge uh, of whether it's worth it to harvest or not. We're, we're right at that point. If we get one more rain event before harvest, then we'll walk away from the crop those massive rain events that last for like two days and it just doesn't stop raining. Because then the cherries just, they just keep expanding and expanding until they, until they just split. There's no question in my mind that, uh, that climate change uh, is having not only a direct impact on, uh, on the globe, but uh, specifically to our own farm. For British Columbia, I think water issues will be some of the, the, the biggest issues for us both lack of and too much of. That is, we'll have lots of water in BC. In fact, too much. But it'll come at times when we don't want it and not at times as we do want it. 
You can go from a flood to a drought in the same year. You could have your flood in May, then you don't get any rain or anything for a few months, and now you're in a drought. It, it can happen that fast. Climate change is projecting that we're going to have longer, hotter summers, which means that the demand for water increases. We are going to have these longer summers, so we'll have be sucking more out of the uh, lakes, aquifers, and reservoirs for a longer period of time to produce more food. This area really is like a canary in the coal mine. It's not like you can get water from elsewhere, so people in this valley have to find ways to make ends meet. So I'm tracking the weather, probably not even daily, but almost hourly, because it affects every decision I make to make sure that I keep these guys as happy as possible. If you stress the, uh, the trees at all, of course, the size of the fruit not only goes down, but you don't get as much uh, sugar in the fruit as well. This does impact our fruit supply. Forests are also threatened by climate change, which increases the risk of fires like the ones that recently swept our province. While fires are a natural part of forest ecosystems, climate change raises temperatures and makes forests hotter, drier, and more explosive when ignited by humans or lightning. Climate change is also likely to create more lightning storms, which will further contribute to sparking more wildfires. The experiences of people from the Kelowna area show how dramatic an impact wildfire can have on people's lives. Back about 10 years ago, there started to be a whole lot of concern about drought and climate change. There was a huge fires in Kelowna in 2003. Those coincided with a major drought year, one of the worst drought years since the 1930s Depression era. Well, when I started in 96 here, you know, the wildfires at the time were smaller and not as extreme. And then, of course, as we rolled into 2003, we had a real extreme year of fires. And after that 2003 year, it seems every three, four years, we end up with another cycle of larger fires, longer fire seasons now. Since Europeans came to this area, they've been putting fires out. And that, that is a huge factor for us because you get fuel load that's basically 100 years of composting material from from the trees and trees that die and fall down and so on. We on the west side had front row seats for the devastation in Kelowna and they lost about 240 homes. Carried over really quickly and as you guys can see, all the burnt trees. The fire was literally hopping from place to place to place, a couple hundred feet at a time. Some trees were just candling, just blowing up. It kind of looked like a worm movie with houses blowing up all over the place. Uh, an amazing sight in nature to see, but it changed a lot of our lives. It was pretty horrific. At one point, the wind changed and it started to blow down this hill toward these houses. That's when we got evacuated. If you've been evacuated, life is never the same. You're always a little bit on edge as soon as you see a fire. If there's smoke on the mountain over here, something starts up, I guarantee you there'll be 300 phone calls to 911 reporting it. When you have aircraft flying around an area for a week on end, nonstop during daylight hours, that's going, you know, they're burning a lot of fuel and paying a lot of wages. Something major is always happening now where wildland fires that take five, six, seven days to put out. The demand on the people and the citizens is going to be immense if it continues to become more frequent. Instead of just August, now we're starting in July and going through to September. The amount of incidents that we get that require a large scale operation seem to be becoming more frequent. You sit there and go, how much impact is climate going to be on your work in the future? So we live with it is, is uh, really clearly the answer. I, you know, I don't think we're going to stop it. Uh, we can minimize it, we can manage it, uh, but I don't think we're going to, to put fires out of business in this valley.
You just get used to having forest fires all the time and that's the norm and then you forget about what it's like to not have forest fires. The world is shifting and uh, we're just going to have to change to keep up with it. The loss, not only to human property, but the loss of forest ecosystems is massive. And we've seen that in 2017 in spades, when it seemed as if all of BC was under forest fire alert. That's a consequence of climate change. Climate change has also increased the risk of forest insect outbreaks. Mountain pine beetle, although a native insect to Western Canada, has devastated forests across British Columbia in recent decades. Since 1990, the beetle has killed about 50% of the commercial lodgepole pine in the province and affected approximately 18 million hectares of forests. This is one of the most significant climate change impacts experienced in BC to date. We've seen uh, a lot longer summers, meaning that there's two flights of mountain pine beetle, and that was unprecedented. You know, that happened more and more in the last 20 years. Forest policies allowed a lot of the trees to grow old. Uh, a pine tree can only grow old like to 100, 120 years, and then they can't fend off pine beetles. The, the pine beetle died, killed the tree. The needles would go red, and there were vast areas of our forest that were red, blood red. Really, you know, you've seen a vast area being infested faster and faster and quicker. Normally after a year or two, we get cold enough winters that it actually kills the overwintering beetles in the trees. This didn't happen. We, we went for about 23 years in this zone without getting those types of conditions. So populations were allowed to build up. We had this, this rare and, and highly unusual, enormous outbreak. You know, most people will tell you that we simply haven't seen anything like that before in the province or perhaps anywhere in the world. And some of these areas are our actual carbon sinks. The more forested land we leave up, the more carbon that we can sequester in those areas and, and becomes a sink. We're trying to get back some sort of balance to this imbalance of CO2 emissions and how it's contributing to, to climate change. We're burning fossil fuels at an alarming rate. This releases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that cause climate change. The Earth has many ecosystems that can absorb and store carbon dioxide, which are known as carbon sinks. For example, trees breathe and retain carbon dioxide in their trunks, limbs, and leaves. Oceans are another carbon sink. Oceans cover 70% of the planet. They are the largest part of the skin of the Earth. And the interface between the air, the atmosphere, and the oceans is where materials come and go back and forth. As we've increased the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, at that interface, carbon dioxide dissolves as carbonic acid. So that increases the acidity of uh, the oceans. When I saw the the statistics on how much we've changed the acidity, I was shocked. I said, that's a tiny amount, until I realized that our blood has the same pH as the oceans. If our blood changed its pH to the extent that the oceans have been changed, we'd be dead. Our bodies evolved to have a certain pH in our blood, and these tiny changes have enormous ramifications, and it's the same in the oceans. As a result, the burning of fossil fuels is literally changing the chemistry of the oceans and adversely affecting marine life. No one knows this better than scallop farmers in the Qualicum Beach area. A 
I'm Rob Saunders. I'm the CEO of Island Scallops. Uh, Island Scallops has been in business since 1989. As the name suggests, our primary interest is scallops, which we produce in a hatchery, uh, grow as small seed, and then move it to the ocean where it's grown up to a scallop. There's scallops in this tank. There's about 200 million, give or take. They're about five days old, and in another 15 days, they'll be about uh, 250 microns, a quarter of a millimeter, and then they'll go through metamorphosis and become a baby scallop. For the first 20 years, 18 years, uh, the ocean was very, very stable. We measured salinity, temperature, and pH, and we saw very, very small fluctuations. 2010, we started to see some pH drops down to 7.95. A drop like that, you start to pay attention to it. We started to notice our larvae weren't swimming very well, they weren't feeding, they were dying at a tremendous rate, and so it was somewhat correlated with that change in pH. And if you convert that to partial pressure of CO2 in the ocean, that's over a thousand parts per million. 1600 ppm. This is the problem right here. That's four times <laughs> atmospheric. Right. And when they're grown in water, but with this CO2 concentration, they hardly swim. They sort of barrel roll, and they don't eat, and then they die very, very easily. So we'll take a look at it and see. See, they're only seven days old, and they haven't grown overnight. And they're just lying there, and they should be swimming like bees. We now call it the lazy larvae syndrome. So we thought we could control uh, the, the problems in the hatchery by buffering the seawater. And so that's a lime tank, essentially, and it brings up the pH. Fresh water comes in here, it's mixed with the calcium hydroxide, and then drips into the large reservoir here. That seems to have made a significant impact on us in 2012. Larvae started to perform, they started to swim, they started to feed, we didn't have the mortality. We're back down to producing less than a billion larvae a year and we were all quite happy. Invested several million dollars in nets and ropes and boats and expanded the farming operation. And we were coming up to our first significant harvest in 2013. Once we were out in mother nature, where you can't make those changes, we started to see some mortality, like 10 or 15 percent. Nothing to cause a great deal of angst, but by Early July, we were up in the 50%, and by August, we had pretty much lost everything. So 10 million animals gone in such a short period of time. No company can withstand those type of losses. We're struggling. We're down to about a third of what we employ. The, the focus for us now is to try as fast as we can to find something that, that's going to succeed in that ocean. There's no question that the atmospheric CO2 is increasing. Global warming, I don't think there's any doubt. The Pacific Ocean and the province's streams are warming, which is having a huge impact on fish, specifically salmon, given their temperature sensitivity. Climate change is amplifying a long list of stressors salmon already face. Salmon migrations, stretching up to 3,000 kilometers, are among the world's most awe-inspiring. After spending adult lives in the ocean, salmon make the arduous trip up rivers against the current, returning to spawn and die where they hatched. Salmon define West Coast communities, especially indigenous ones, and support sustainable livelihoods, food, and culture. The salmon for us is something that we look forward to and to help sustain us. We all grew up on it. From the time we were kids, it was probably our first meal. Our water starting to warm up, and when our waters get too warm, our fish start dying. Some of the creeks, we used to get fish in there every year. Now I'm seeing creeks empty, like absolutely empty, just extinct, nothing in there at all fish go back to where they were born and to where it's in their DNA. And if that DNA changes within that water, 
They don't come back anymore. We got warmer water. It's definitely going to dictate where the fish go. It's going to obviously uh, bring their survival rate down and, and possibly introduce a lot more foreign species, which you know are harmful to our native species. Some of the changes that we've already seen and people have observed, including and especially those that spend a lot of time on water, like First Nations, coastal communities, um, fishermen, are species appearing that don't usually occur in places that they're now being found. We have fishermen that are out there that are fishing the oceans and catching fish that have big yellow lesions on the side. We have our olecans that are coming back into the nest that have mites in their gills. And first time we're seeing them now. You know, we've never noticed that before. Our water's starting to warm up where the fish are migrating to. You know, they're picking these different things up. The whole global look on things is not good. I mean, overall, it's kind of scary. It would be very sad for the province overall if we did have the warming water permanently move in. I mean, obviously, it's going to devastate uh, my livelihood, the whole industry overall, uh, sports fishing as a community, commercial fishing as a community. So, uh, you know, this is a valuable resource that's priceless. And I think if, if there's anything that we can do, we should be doing to protect it. We're obviously seeing an impact on all kinds of ocean creatures. Not only is it the climate, but it's the continuation of this industrial culture. The Industrial Revolution ramped up the global use of fossil fuels to spur economic growth. However, it also increased greenhouse gas emissions and temperatures worldwide. As we've seen, these global changes are having local effects in British Columbia, which are changing our ecosystems and challenging our communities. The debate regarding fossil fuels, pipelines and super tankers continues to rage across our landscape. We have to ask, are we going to continue development of oil and gas projects knowing there will be global and local consequences? The cumulative effects of development has a great effect on uh, climate change and it's coming to a place that we maybe we can't come back from. Fundamentally, I think there's just some projects out there that indigenous people and, and people, Canadians, British Columbians have a right to say no to. We have the grandest of all ironies happening, which is Alberta via the Ottawa dictating a natural energy policy on us in British Columbia and telling us it's in our best interest to pipe diluted bitumen on these coastal waters here. Poll after poll shows that British Columbians do not want diluted bitumen in pipelines and we do not want diluted bitumen super tankers in our waters. What about no do people not get? 300 tankers a year going past me on my right shoulder here, I don't think British Columbians want that. You know, we've been trying to find the, the space for us to talk about the protection of Haida Gwaii, you know, in regards to shipping and tankers. But the only way we were able to have that conversation was to step into an oil room or an LNG room and embrace the prospects of gearing up for more. And the Haida Nation wasn't interested in participating in that conversation because we're not supportive of oil or LNG. You know, that's what we're talking about when people in the city, you know, can't appreciate where, uh, where we're coming from. I mean, come to Haida Gwaii and see what's at stake. How would you like it if it ran through your backyard and you bear all the risk of uh, catastrophe? I see a lot of the proposed developments, LNG and the expansion of the Kinder Morgan pipeline as having the potential to be devastating for marine ecosystems and for human communities. There's always the potential risk of a large-scale spill of sorts, and that's the part that would be absolutely devastating. Our people are aware of what the strongest threats are. The bottom line is, you know, if there's no oil spill, our total way of life will be changed. Our culture will be stripped from us. It's who we are.
There is need for money as a resource, but it's not the be-all and end-all for us. It's more about the human well-being of our community and our, our region. We'll take and use any means possible to protect our way of life, to defend the coast. You know, it's not an Aboriginal issue. Most of BC doesn't want to see it happen. I would want to see it. Not those super tankers they're talking about coming through our waters. The major potential for disaster. If any of those ships hit a rock in our area, we'll be devastated. All our food will be gone. On October 13th, 2016, a tugboat named the Nathan E. Stewart struck ground and sank near Bella Bella, a town of approximately 1,500 in the heart of Hiltzik territory. The tug spilled over 100,000 liters of fuel and other oils into the coastal waters, polluting marine ecosystems, nearby islands, and community harvesting grounds. Right here is the exact site where the Nathan E. Stewart ran aground. It missed its turn and it came and slammed into these rocks right here. The sinking of the Nathan E. Stewart was equivalent to the death of a family member and forever changed the life of the Hiltzok people. For the Hiltzok, it was more than an environmental disaster since the spill affected their food supply as well as their social, economic, cultural and spiritual ways. It also highlighted the deficiencies in Canada's marine spill response and foreshadows increasing shipping along the coast involving supertankers carrying far more oil. The question remains, what does development look like and whose priorities will be listened to moving forward? We're not anti-development. We're very much pro-sustainable development. It's about trying to work, you know, in a collaborative way with the governments, both BC and Canada. What is sustainable development? You know, and, and to be a part of that dialogue and, and, you know, a part of that equation, because we're here to stay. Our people have 10,000 years of continuous occupation in our territory. There's some fundamental truths, core values that have sustained us and that could be powerful lessons going forward. You know, it's just not about quarterly profit margins for corporate interests. You can't eat money. It's not going to sustain you. You're not going to fill you up. You can't eat that money that's so easy. Everybody's throwing it out there when they want something. Throw a lot of money in front of you. If you take it, by the time everything's gone, you can't eat it. We have to turn a corner on finding a more sustainable way and transition out of this, this resource. If you know, It took a billion years or more for it to become what it is, and we're going to burn it up in, uh, in 50 years. You know, I've heard the tar sands being characterized like uh, an ecological time bomb. And then what about our next generation? If you look at you know, the pipelines coming from the tar sands or even the natural gas pipelines that would be going to LNG plants, they're all moving carbon, some from BC, some from outside BC. We're moving massive amounts of carbon through this province, all largely invisible to people. These are pipelines to the sky. These are taking carbon and sticking it in the air. Sooner or later, somewhere along the way, it gets burnt, it goes up there. If we say yes to tar sands, we say yes to LNG, we say yes to tankers and pipelines and, and driving to work every day. If we say yes to that, then our kids, our grandkids, will have a way tougher time. Whether it's food prices or environmental refugees, whatever it is, anything we can do to make that picture more attractive, more resilient, get off carbon, low carbon living, any way we can do it. Keep it in the ground, develop the renewable energy, get green energy, get green jobs. Just building much more low carbon, resilient communities that people like, attractive communities that they can enjoy, have some control over and feel more secure in. I've lived in Vancouver for nearly all of my life. 
It's a culturally diverse, populous, and densely lived in area with around two and a half million people living in Greater Vancouver. Vancouver is at the forefront of the Green Cities movement, and it's increasingly opposed to fossil fuel development and shipping in the region. It's remarkable what's possible when citizens and politicians unite to support an environmentally responsible civic agenda. Vancouverites do not support the pipeline or tanker. There's nothing about the future of Vancouver that we see aligned with the concept of being a major oil port. We imagine by the year 2050 that we will not be combusting fossil fuels. And it's why we have a mandate to, to fight against things like the Kinder Morgan pipeline. If one were a city that didn't want to be burning fossil fuels by the year 2050, it doesn't make any sense at all to build a piece of infrastructure that will be there for 100 years. So back in 2008, when Mayor Gregor Robertson was first running for elected office to become mayor, uh, he put out this idea that Vancouver could be the greenest city in the world by 2020. Uh, at that time, it engendered a range of responses from, are you crazy, to why would anyone want to be the greenest city in the world, or that's just not possible. We were elected in 2008, late in the year, and uh, 2009, the very first thing we did was get going on the Greenest City Action Plan. So at that point, people said, well, maybe it's worth doing, but how are you going to do it? Ultimately, the answers are pretty straightforward. If you're trying to be the greenest city in the world by the year 2020, you look at all the other cities and you choose a marker that's a little bit beyond the goals that they have for 2020. It's not unlike if you're retrofitting your house. We're essentially retrofitting a city, both structurally, but also with policy retrofits. You know, our role as a city is to make it easy for people, to make it easy for them to put that organic material in the green bin instead of in the garbage, to make it easy for them and safe for them to get around on a bike or to get things in proximity so they can walk places. And so instead of prioritizing the car as we design our communities, we prioritize the pedestrian. That's the number one priority and we try to design around that. And so kind of turning on our heads the way that we invest in the infrastructure for mobility in our neighborhoods. We're demonstrating that you can build green buildings and that people want to be in them, that you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from existing buildings with a really aggressive green building strategy that we've adopted for carbon. I think it took us about six months to realize we were actually writing policy for cities around the world. We've been contacted now by over 2,000 cities. It's a great opportunity for us to, to sit down with them and say, what can we learn from each other on this? So what we've been doing here in Vancouver is learning from European cities and integrating district energies. You run your dishwasher, you take a shower. What we're doing is we're taking the energy out of the hot water, putting it into pipes and heating the entire neighborhood. So if you live in that neighborhood, you have a 70% lower greenhouse gas profile for your home than if you did elsewhere. For the city, we've really learned that when we set goals, no matter how ambitious they are, um, we actually, we're getting there. We're exactly where we expected to be in every single policy area, which is astounding. Vancouver does have currently the lowest greenhouse gas emissions per person for any city in North America. Vancouver is demonstrating to the world that cities can drive down carbon and by doing so, become more competitive. We've been ranked as one of the highest quality of life of any city in the world. This vibrant future for Vancouver is exciting and demonstrates that a society based on environmental principles is both possible and prosperous. Cities which now in Canada house 80 to 85% of all Canadians, this is where the action is on climate change. Canada is under enormous pressure to stay locked into the fossil fuel economy, and the battle over energy and pipelines will likely persist. 
the decisions we make now will affect many generations to come here at home and around the world. We've already started on the path. We've already made the investment. We're many, many years into having a carbon tax. We're many years into pushing green buildings. Let's not stop now and throw it away for short-term pipelines and liquid natural gas facilities that are going to take our resources and export them right off our coast like we've always done with everything. What I don't buy into is telling any my kids or anyone else's kids that they don't have a future. That's what the dominant environmental narrative tells people. And I think it's pretty hard to motivate a generation to want to get involved with being part of a restoration team if you tell them there's no point because you have no future right from the beginning. It is actually a really exciting time, particularly if you are a youth today. And the reason why I say that is because the opportunities for innovation are unparalleled. The industrial revolution of the James Watt era, you know, it may have been the, the thing of textbooks today, but it will pale in comparison to the industrial revolution that we're seeing now as we transform our energy systems to those that are renewable. And the opportunities for the youth of today are second to none. Now we're seeing massive market transformation. We're seeing for the first time new investments in renewable outpace new investment in fossil fuels on a global level. I mean, the, the transformation is happening. So I think it's time for Canadians to get bold and to say we're clean energy sustainability innovators. And we can be leaders in the world in that and be respected for that and to really start to see some of these short-term boom and bust fossil fuel developments for what they are, which is short-term boom and bust. And we will get the bust. And this time the bust is gonna be on a much bigger level. So let's not go there because we have another path we've already started on and it's working. I know that we're holding the line and doing our best, but we can't do it by ourselves and we need allies and we need supporters. We have to take responsibility. We can't, in our own private lives, abdicate. It's too big for me. We're all in this canoe together. We all have to work together. We have to come up with solutions. And now we need Canada to come to the table. You know, we're prepared to have these tough conversations but we're not prepared to allow the natural capital of our traditional territory to be bankrupted. First Nations and now in First Nations, we have to work together to come to a common goal. And that common goal is to save this world for the future generations to come. And I think if you look at those values that we're brought up with, we're brought up with respect uh, for the environment. And that means taking what, only what nature can provide. So it's not over exploiting the resource, it's just taking what you need for yourself, for your family, your community, and, uh, and allow it to be there for the next generation. And you know, that's really what it's all about. Mother Nature, you know, it doesn't see race, religion, or creed. It, you know, it's going to do what it's going to do. And, and, you know, we all have to pay the price, you know, if we're indigenous or non-indigenous. We can't get beyond climate change in the sense that some of it is real and some of it is irreversible already. I think some people think, you know, it's a slow process. It's not. It's a rapid process. And uh, it's already too late for some things, but it's certainly not too late to do the big things that we have to do. We have to support each other. So we live and coexist in a peaceful harmony with the land and, and with ourselves. This journey through BC's climate story has demonstrated the problems and possibilities that we face as a local and global community. As a scientist, I'm enough of a realist to see where all the data are going. Many of my colleagues who I have tremendous respect for are saying, look, it's too late. Humans have become too powerful. But I tell them, look, we don't know enough to say it's too late. 
And I use an example that the most prized species of salmon in the world is called the sockeye. The biggest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River in my home in British Columbia. And in 2009, fisheries reported that there would be just over one million sockeye returning to the Fraser River. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, that's it, it's too late. There isn't the biomass of sockeye to get up to the spawning beds, they're gone. One year later, we got the biggest run of sockeye salmon in the Fraser in 100 years. Nobody knows what happened. Nature shocked us. It's my belief that nature has all kinds of surprises for us. The challenge for humanity is to pull back and give nature a chance. They're doing a, a, a salmon enhancement program along the creek here. Here's where the salmon usually come right in this corner. Wow! There is salmon right there. Okay, look at them. One, two, three, four, five, five of them. They come up here to spawn in the place where they were born. It's uncanny how they can sense it. <laughs> 